Okay, so um, let me uh, re uh, recall what we did in the last lecture. So, if you remember, the theme that we are discussing is about zeros of analytic functions. Okay, and uh, as you know, the the residue theorem allows you to uh, compute the number of zeros. Okay, and uh, in in that is through the so-called argument principle. And uh, then uh, uh, we saw uh, Roche's theorem, which tells us that if you take an analytic function and change it uh, by a small amount, that you may that is you add a smaller function to it, a function that is smaller on the boundary curve, in in of course in magnitude or modulus, then the there is no change in the number of zeros. Okay. And uh, then what we discussed in the last lecture was uh, Hurwitz's theorem. Hurwitz's theorem, which says that the zero of uh, limit of analytic functions uh, is uh, coming from uh, zeros of uh, the functions in the limit. Okay, so um, so let me uh, uh, let me just recall that. So here is here is Hurwitz's theorem. So you assume that uh, f k uh, is a sequence of analytic functions which converges to the function f normally uh, in normally on uh, a domain D. So let me let me recall that uh, domain is an open connected set; it need not be bounded, and uh, uh, of course, subset of the complex plane, and all these fk's are analytic functions defined on D. And this f that this the statement that fk converges to f normally means that the convergence is uh, uniform on compact subsets. Okay. Uh, and then, what would be this theorem says is that if you take a zero of f let z0 uh, belonging to D be a 0 of f of order m0. So uh, as I explained in the last lectures uh, it will follow that f is analytic okay because of normal convergence a normal limit of analytic functions is again analytic okay that is essentially because of the uniform convergence on compact subsets. And since analytic function has uh, zeros which are isolated, okay, you can always find uh, given any zero, you can find uh, a disk surrounding that zero where there are no other zeros. Okay, so uh, I'm suppose I pick uh, zero of the limit function, and suppose zero is of uh, order m naught. Okay, uh, then there exists a row greater than zero such that uh, for k sufficiently large uh, f k has exactly m m not zeros in mod z minus z not uh, strictly less than rho And uh, uh, z not is an accumulation point point of such uh, zeros as, if you want, rho tends to zero. Okay. So this is Hurwitz's theorem, and. Uh, um, I explained a proof of the of this theorem, and basically uh, the proof, of course, used the argument principle. Okay. Uh, 
in fact uh, uh, I mean the basic idea of the proof was the, the idea of the proof I gave last time was you just calculate 1 by 2 pi i integral over mod z minus z not equal to rho of d log f k and uh, show that this tends to 1 by 2 pi i integral over mod z minus z not equal to rho of d log f where of course d log f k stands for f k prime the derivative first derivative of f k divided by f k d z and uh, similarly d log f stands for uh, f prime by f the first derivative of f divided by f the logarithmic derivative d z okay and uh, of course the 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 more serious point of the proof was that you will have to show that this is defined this is defined and then this converges to that and of course argument the argument principle will tell you that uh, this is actually m0 and this if you call this as mk then the argument will tell you that mk uh, then of course this this m0 is of course the value of this integral is m0 which is the number of zeros of uh, f in this inside the inside the region uh, bounded by this circle and uh, of course uh, you know uh, uh, you do not uh, uh, I mean you choose this disc as I told you in such a way that there are no other zeros of f and similarly this quantity if you call this as m sub k that will be the number of zeros of f k inside this disc and uh, this argument uh, tells you that uh, uh, this m k converges to m naught and but then m k being a sequence of integers when you say a sequence of integers converges to an integer it means that beyond a certain stage the sequence of integers is just that constant integer which is the limit okay. So that means that m k is equal to m naught for k sufficiently large and that is the conclusion of the theorem and uh, of course the argument if it works for a certain row it will start it will work for smaller rows okay or if you take smaller radii it will work. So uh, 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 so this is m naught implies that m k is equal to m naught for large k okay and of course diagrammatically uh, diagrammatically what this means is that you see if z naught is a point here where you have a, a 0 of f uh, this is the this centered at uh, z naught radius rho then you can find uh, all these zeros of uh, these are zeros of uh, uh, of f k uh, and all these zeros they converge to z naught as you make rho smaller okay. Uh, now what I wanted to uh, discuss is uh, the two things I want to discuss one is that there is another proof that you can give uh, which actually uses Roche's theorem okay and uh, then I also wanted to discuss about the application uh, of the application which says that if you take a, a normal uh, limit of univalent functions and the limit is non constant uh, then the limit is uh, the limiting function is again univalent where of course univalent means one to one. So, so let me let me first do that so, so let me look at this application again uh, if f k converges to f normally and each uh, each f k is univalent on d then uh, f is either constant or univalent on t where of course univalent means one to one which is also called a reinjected okay. So this is the this is an application of uh, Hurwitz's theorem and <coughs> I just wanted to uh, uh, look at this proof uh, 
see so I will I, I know that each fk is 1 1 I want to show that f is 1 1 and of course I uh, the, the 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 result says that f is 1 1 provided f is not constant so you assume f is not constant okay assume f is not constant so you know uh, I want you to uh, remember that the moment I say that uh, f has a 0 of order m finite order uh, I am assuming that uh, f is not constant okay because if f is constant then f has to be identically 0 and if f is identically 0 then uh, basically you do not uh, uh, you, you will not get a uh, you will you will not be able to find a disc surrounding a 0 uh, uh, where there are no other zeros because every point is a 0 okay. So you must understand that this Hurwitz theorem applies only to a non constant uh, uh, it applies only to the case when f is uh, uh, you know uh, non constant analytic function okay. So even the theorem on uh, the set of zeros of an analytic function being isolated assumes that you are working with a an analytic function which is not constant for a non constant analytic function the zeros are isolated okay. So non constant is always there at the at the back of it uh, back of all this okay so so assume f is not constant but it is important that is the reason why I am uh, I am insisting sometimes we might uh, be careless enough not to write it or insist but it is very important it is there in the background. So assume f is not constant suppose uh, uh, f of z1 is equal to f of z2 is equal to omega naught uh, I will have to show uh, that uh, uh, for z1 z2 in D <coughs> I will have to show that uh, z1 equal to z2 and what do I do I apply Hurwitz's theorem so here is my z1 and you know there is a row and there is a disc surrounding row so that I can find uh, zeros uh, zeta I can find a 0 zeta i of uh, of uh, zeta i is 0 of f of z minus omega naught okay so what you must understand is f k converges to f so f k of z uh, uh, so I should be f k so f k of z converges to f of z so f k of z minus uh, uh, omega naught converges to f minus omega naught okay and it is again normal convergence. So I am applying Hurwitz's theorem to not to f not to this but I am applying it to the sequence with uh, minus uh, omega naught added on both sides okay okay. So, so I can find a 0 z, uh, z zeta i of f k of z minus w naught and of course you know uh, uh, I, I let me write it as k i for k i uh, sufficient sufficiently large and you know the same way uh, uh, so there is also the point z2 I again take uh, uh, a similar disc of radius rho of course you know uh, uh, this rho here is chosen so that z z0 z1 is the only zero of f of z minus uh, w0 in in this disk and here also uh, uh, i'm trying to choose uh, rho of the same type that is one in which uh, in this disk z2 is the only zero of f of z minus uh, omega0 but what I want to tell you is that to begin with this row 1 uh, these rows may be different uh, this may be row 1 that may be some row 2 but then I am saying take the minimum if you want take the minimum row of and and uh, and do it for the minimum value of row okay and uh, so that row is the minimum <coughs> value okay and what you do is here again uh, Hurwitz's theorem will tell you that I will get uh, an eta i so I will get eta i. Uh, 0 of uh, f of k i of z minus omega naught for k i sufficiently large 
and you see the uh, the little point to note is that I am choosing the same k i okay this this k i that I got for this may be uh, different from that k i okay so in fact I should call this as if you want k i and k prime i but then it holds for all values beyond a certain stage then I can take the maximum of those two and call that as k i okay so that is the adjustment I make. So what you must understand is that this row in principle I should write as row 1 and that I should write as row 2 okay and this I should write as k i and that I should write as k i prime okay but I can choose uh, the maximum of k i and k i prime and replace that k i call that as k i okay and I can take the minimum of row 1 and row 2 and call that as row okay and uh, then you know what you can do is once you have done it for row you can next do it uh, uh, so so you know uh, uh, maybe maybe I'll first call it as a, let me first call this as uh, uh, let me do it for uh, uh, okay so let me do the following thing uh, here instead of row let me put row by i okay instead of row let me put row by i right so <coughs> So the point is that the reason why I am putting rho by i is that you know uh, uh, the distance between zeta i and z1 is uh, uh, less than uh, rho by i which as i tends to infinity goes to 0 which tells you that the zeta i's will converge to z1 and the eta i's will converge to z2 okay. So I can do uh, I can take this uh, uh, these rho, rho by i's and you must think that as I increase this i okay then the uh, for example if I put i equal to 1 it is uh, just rho if I put i equal to 2 it is rho by 2 okay then it becomes rho by 3 you get smaller and smaller and smaller uhhh disks okay. So with with this kind of thing what you get is uh, the following you get that uh, uh, okay so I should I should try to rewrite this as a zeta i so you see zeta i uh, converges to uhhh uh, z1 uhhh eta i also converges to it converges to z2 uhhh fk i of zeta i is uh, is actually w0 which is equal to fk i of eta i because zeta i is a 0 of fk i of z minus w0 and is also a 0 eta i is also a 0 of fk i of z minus w0 and but then fk i is given to be uh, 1 to 1 so this will tell you that uh, zeta i is equal to eta i eta i uh, since fk i uh, univalent and this implies uh, taking limits that uh, limit zeta i is limit eta i but that that means you will get z1 equal to z and that finishes the proof okay. So what I want to tell you is that uh, you have you have to do be a little careful in choosing the the zeta i's and eta i's okay and you so you should so basically you should choose a set of sequence of zeta i's which converges to z1 and a sequence of eta i's which converges to z2 as i tends to infinity okay so, so that is the proof now uh, what I want to discuss next is uh, another proof of Hurwitz's theorem which is uh, which actually uses Roche's theorem okay so so you so uh, so recall uh, what what was what was Roche's theorem see Roche's theorem <coughs> basically says that if you have uh, the number of zeros of an analytic function in a simple closed inside a simple closed curve uh, is not going to change if you add to the analytic function uh, another analytic function which is a smaller function on the boundary okay so let me write that so let uh, uh, l of z and uh, b of z be analytic on uh, d union uh, dou d where uh, uh, d is 
bounded and uh, dou d is uh, a, a, uh, uh, is p is, is, is a contour ok. So, it is a piecewise smooth uh, contour and the function the both functions so l is supposed to be thought of as the little function b is or thought of so to be thought of as a bigger function ok. Uh, suppose uh, that the little function is lesser than the bigger function in modulus strictly lesser than on the boundary ok. Then uh, then uhhh uh, b of z and b of z plus l of z have the same uh, number of zeros. inside d ok. This is the this is Roche's theorem where you think of uh, so what it says is the number of zeros of b z is the same as the number of zeros of b z plus l z now that b z plus l z is thought of as a small perturbation of b because you have added the error term that you have added is l of z which is analytic of course. But the point is that l of z is strictly smaller than b of z in magnitude on the boundary ok. So, this is as if you remember we proved this very easily using the argument principle, but the point is this also yields a beautiful proof of uh, Hurwitz's theorem ok. So, how how so uh, the reason why I am doing this is uh, 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 this uh, uh, this discussion of uh, you know uh, zeros of analytic functions essentially uses residue theorem I mean argument principle and all these ideas are interrelated ok. So, you should understand how each idea uh, you know uh, is, is, is kind of connected to another ok. So, you see so uh, proof proof of uh, Kurwitz's theorem using uh, Roche's theorem. So, you see it is a uh, uh, suppose I want to prove this using Roche's theorem then it is very easy to guess what you have to do you see what is what does Roche's theorem uh, what does Hurwitz's theorem actually want to say it wants to say that you know uh, uh, in a disc like this uh, f and f k have the same number of zeros that is what you want to say. So, you see so it is very clear that uhhh you know uh, uh, you have to take one fun one of the big functions uh, the the big function has to be f ok and this and the small function should be chosen. So, that uh, when you add it to the big function you get f k see the 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 Roche's theorem says that the big function uhhh and uhhh the big big function plus a smaller function they have the same number of zeros ok. Now, if you want to uh, get this from that then you sh but here I want f and f k to be uh, the two functions for which the number of zeros are the same beyond a certain stage. So, the big function has to be f and the big function plus a small perturbation must be f k ok. So, the small perturbation has to be f k minus f it is it is very simple to see that. So, so what you do is put uh, uh, take uh, rho so that uh, 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 mod uh, so that there is no 0 of f of z other than uh, uh, z naught in uhhh well uhhh uh, 0 less than or equal to mod z minus z not less than or equal to rho choose such a uh, choose such a rho of course as I told you this is possible because uh, you are assuming that f is analyt analytic uh, I mean you have that f is analytic ok that is because uh, f is a normal li limit of analytic functions right. And 
uh, then put a big function to be f of z little function to be f k of z minus f of z okay then you know of course if I add the 2 I will get f k okay and of course to apply uh, Roche's theorem I am I am I am the 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 domain on which I am apply, uh, applying Roche's theorem is this disc is this disc and the boundary is just the uh, boundary circle okay. So I am applying uh, Roche's theorem here okay I am just applying Roche's theorem here all right to the little function and the big function and uh, I will get that the big function which is f and the sum of the big function and the little function which is fk they will have the same number of zeros okay provided the little function is really little than the big on the boundary okay but you see it is it is uh, that is something that you can uh, that is something that you can easily see because you see see fk of z fk converges to f normally this implies that you know fk my fk minus f goes to 0 okay fk minus f goes to 0 that is what it means and uh, that also normally okay and of course in this case normally uh, means that uh, uh, it will be uniformly in this region. So, so I should say uh, uh, so in fact I can rub off this normally here and simply write uniformly in in this uh, and uh, this is also uniformly goes to 0 uniformly in mod z minus z not less than or equal because the convergence is uniform on compact subsets okay and mod z minus z not less than or equal to rho is a compact subset it is closed and bounded. So, but but what does this mean? This means that uh, uh, the uh, the modulus of this can be made lesser than any small quantity. That's what it means. And you see, uh, f note that that uh, f uh, mod f is uh, is greater than or equal to delta on uh, mod z minus z not is equal to rho okay this is a fact that we also used in during the proof of Fourier system because you see mod see mod f is a continuous function okay it is a continuous real valued function and when define and when you restrict it to mod z minus z not equal to rho mod z minus z not equal to rho is a circle centered at z not radius rho that is compact because it is closed and bounded okay. So we have this fact from analysis you take a real valued continuous real valued function if you restrict it to a compact set then it will be uniformly continuous and it will attain its bounds. So in particular mod f will have a lower bound it will have an upper bound and it will take the lower value and it will take the upper value also okay and delta is the lower value okay on 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 this uh, compact set the circle boundary circle okay and and of course this delta is positive that is because mod f is positive uh, mod f vanishes only at the center and uh, it does not vanish anywhere else. So it is on the boundary it is positive therefore the minimum value is also positive okay and that is bec and because the minimum value is taken by mod f okay and mod f cannot be 0 if mod f is 0 then f is 0 and f is not supposed to be f is not supposed to vanish anywhere in that closed disk except at the center that is the choice of rho okay. So mod f is greater than equal to delta but then uh, so you know f k minus f converges to 0 uniformly means that I can choose a you know uh, index large enough index uh, n such that for k greater than or equal to n f k minus f in modulus can be made less than delta I can do that okay since f k minus f 
converges to 0 uniformly in mod z minus z0 less than or equal to rho we can choose so let me continue here we can choose we can find uh, n such that k greater than or equal to n implies that mod f k minus f can be made less than delta I mean this is just uh, uniform convergence okay and this is uh, I am not writing f k of z minus f of z because all this is done independent of z and this independence of on of z is exactly the uniformness of convergence okay. So this n does not depend on z it does not depend on what value of z you plug in uh, where z is in this uh, closed disc okay that is the uniformness that I am using there alright and but 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 you see this is the but delta is less than or equal to mod f. So what you get is uh, you get the modulus of the little function is strictly less than modulus of the big function by our choices and that is precisely what you need to apply Ruscius theorem okay. So, so by Ruscius theorem f of z which is b z and f k of z which is b of z plus l of z have the same number of zeros in mod z minus z not strictly less than for k greater than and that is exactly Hurwitz's theorem okay. So you see you get Hurwitz's theorem uh, uh, as, uh, as a consequence of Ruscius theorem right fine. So uh, having done this what I want to do next is uh, uh, I want to go to a topic which is called as uh, uh, I, I want to go to the topic of uh, uh, open mappings okay. So I want to prove uh, the very important open mapping theorem the open mapping theorem says that uh, 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 any non constant analytic function maps open sets to open sets okay it is a very deep theorem. But uh, the point is that uh, somehow uh, the proof of the theorem also involves uh, ideas of this type it just involves it is again about zeros of analytic functions okay and it also again literally involves uh, the if you want uh, you know uh, uh, the residue theorem uh, in the in the form of the argument principle okay. So here is the open mapping theorem it is a very it is a very deep theorem very important theorem uh, if f is a non constant analytic function on a domain T then f is an open map. that is for any open set u in, in D f of u is open okay. So this is the open mapping theorem it says that uh, an, a non constant analytic function if you take the under non constant analytic function if you take the image of an open set you will again get an open set okay this is a very deep theorem because you see uh, 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 you cannot find any counterpart for this uh, in uh, for example functions of one real variable okay it is it is uh, uh, it is rather uh, uh, 
I mean it's God given and it's beautiful. Uh, normally you cannot expect a map to take open sets to open sets which is a uh, which is a very important condition it is an important condition because along with this if you put the condition that f is uh, 1 to 1 okay then it means that uh, uh, since f is 1 to 1 f inverse makes sense set theoretically and saying that f is open will tell you that f inverse is a homeomorphism okay and uh, what it will tell you is that uh, uh, that is what we are going to see after this there is an inverse function theorem which will tell you that f inverse is itself is analytic okay that is the next step okay. So uh, put all so for all these things uh, th so the final statement is that if you have an injective uh, analytic map then the image of the source domain will be an open set and f inverse on that open set will again be analytic. So that means that f is an analytic isomorphism okay what it tells you is that uh, an injective analytic map is a isomorphism onto its image which is open analytic isomorphism an inverse has an inverse which is also analytic okay. So the starting point is this for even for the inverse to be even continuous you need uh, the fact that f is open uh, helps. So uh, yeah so how does one prove this so basically uh, you know uh, we do uh, the, the, the idea of proof is, is to count the number of times uh, f takes a value omega naught. So, uh, so it is again a it is again the counting principle the argument principle okay. So uh, in fact uh, uh, so not only count the number of times f takes a value omega naught in fact you also let this omega not to vary okay so so let me explain that so so you see so here is so let me draw a diagram so here is my so here is my source complex plane and uh, well uh, here is some domain and uh, here is <coughs> a point z not and here is my function f f is non constant and uh, this is this is of course the uh, this is the z plane and uh, the target plane is the is also complex numbers but it is the omega plane where omega is equal to f of z okay for if it is one real variable you write y equal to f of x okay since it is one complex variable you write now we now write omega is equal to f of z and suppose uh, uh, you take a value omega naught which is f of z naught okay. Now uh, what one does is uh, how, how will you count uh, the number of times f takes the value uh, omega naught okay. So, so that means you know you have to look you are you are you are you have to think of uh, uh, z naught as a 0 of f of z minus omega naught. you think of you think of uh, uh, z naught as a 0 of f of z minus omega naught you see that is the idea that we, we, have, we have been using all the time right. So think of of omega z naught as a 0 of f of z minus omega naught And notice that f of z minus omega naught is also a non-constant analytic function because if f of z minus z omega naught uh, is constant, that will tell you that f of z is constant. But I assumed f is non-constant. And uh, so, after all, f of z minus omega naught is the analytic function f uh, with minus omega naught added to it. Minus omega naught is just a constant you have added. Adding a constant to an analytic function 
continues to keep it analytic ok. So, uh, if you want because a constant function is trivially analytic ok and the sum of analytic functions is again analytic. So, uh, so again f of z minus omega naught is a non constant analytic function and z naught is a 0. So, the number of times it uh, assumes the value z naught is given by the argument principle in uh, in a disc surrounding z naught uh, where there are no uh, uh, where there are no more uh, zeros other than z naught. So, what you do is that you choose you choose a disc you choose a disc uh, of radius rho ok choose rho uh, so in this case uh, ok so choose rho so that uh, uh, z naught is the only 0 of uh, f of z minus omega naught ok uh, in uh, mod z minus z naught less than or equal to rho in this disc centered at z naught radius rho. So, z naught is the only 0 of f of z minus omega naught this you can do because uh, is f of z minus omega naught is a non constant analytic function and the zeros of a non constant analytic function are isolated. So, the 0 z naught is isolated so you can find a small disc surrounding z naught where there are no other zeros ok even on uh, and you can choose the disc small enough so that there are no zeros on the boundary as well on the boundary circle as well ok. Now uh, so you see so what is the number of uh, number of times f assumes uh, the value uh, not uh, assumes the value omega naught in mod z minus z naught less than rho how is this uh, how is this uh, given by the uh, let me call this n sub w naught this will be 1 by 2 pi i integral over mod z minus z naught equal to rho d log f of uh, z minus w this is just the argument principle the argument principle tells you that uh, 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 d log of something if you take and then you integrate over a simple closed curve and divide by 2 pi i you will get the number of zeros of that inside the closed curve. So, I will get this will actually give me the number of zeros of f of z minus w naught and they will be exactly uh, the number of points inside this re in the region the enclosed by this circle namely the disc uh, centered at z naught radius rho where uh, f takes the value del, uh, w naught ok this is just again by by the argument principle. or so which is a counting principle ok. So, so now what you do is you see uh, note that mod f of z minus w uh, minus omega naught is uh, say again greater than or equal to delta greater than 0 on mod z minus z naught uh, less uh, on z mod, mod minus z, z minus z not equal to rho. So, this is again the same kind of argument that we used earlier uh, namely uh, f z minus w naught does not have any zeros on the uh, on the boundary circle because in this closed disc the only 0 f z of, of f z minus w naught is at z naught at the center. So, there are no zeros on the boundary circle uh, the boundary circle is closed and bounded so it is compact and f z min and mod f z minus w naught is a uh, continuous function when restricted to this compact set it has it is uniformly continuous and it will have a minimum 
and a maximum value and delta is the minimum value and the minimum value is positive because it doesn't vanish okay now uh, you see the trick is what you can do is consider any omega such that mod omega minus uh, uh, omega naught is uh, less than delta okay. So you see it is the same delta I am using so what you do is you now take a disc centered at omega naught and radius delta okay then then you know I can completely replace omega naught in this equation by omega and that will give me the number of times f takes the value omega in the disc mod z minus z naught less than rho. So define n of omega to be 1 by 2 pi i integral over mod z minus z naught equal to rho d log f of z minus omega okay. Mind you uh, this makes sense because you see what is d log f of z uh, what is this this is actually f derivative of this which is f dash of z divided by f z minus w dz this is what it is okay and mind you you see the f z minus w cannot vanish on the boundary okay f z minus w cannot vanish on the boundary why is that so that is because of this choice of w okay the choice of w is that see the choice of w tells you that the distance from w to w0 is less than delta whereas uh, the distance of fz from w0 is greater than or equal to delta okay. So this will tell you that fz uh, 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 fz uh, uh, the modulus of fz minus w cannot be uh, uh, 0 therefore this uh, this is well defined this integral is well defined and what does it give you it gives you the number of times the function f assumes the value w uh, or omega in the unit disc I mean in the disc centered at z0 radius rho. So this is number of times f assumes the value w in mod z minus z naught less than rho okay this makes sense now after having written all this let me tell you that uh, the whole point is that you see if you think of w as now a complex variable okay then this is a function n of w is a function of w okay the amazing fact is but it is it is amazing but it is very easy to prove the amazing fact is that n of w is actually an analytic function of w okay it will turn out that n of w is an analytic function of w okay and that will mean that n of w is constant because you see it is an analytic function but its values are in integers okay and uh, and you know the image of uh, 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 the uh, if you have an analytic function uh, uh, if you take the values of an analytic function okay if uh, for example when I say n of w is an uh, uh, analytic function of w in mod in this disc then this disc is of course connected. So if I take the image of this disc I should get a connected set but on the other hand uh, the values I uh, are integers so I should get a connected set of integers okay but what is a connected set of integers it has to be only a single integer so what it will tell you is that n of w is a single integer 
and that is irrespective of w. So, it will be the same integer as n of w naught ok, but then what does that tell you it tells you that if f assumes the value w naught n w naught times then f assumes every other value w the same n w naught times in this in this disc mod z minus z naught less than rho. What this tells you therefore is that this whole disc is in the image and that is a proof that uh, uh, the image contains an open disc centered at z naught. So, if you take a point uh, uh, centered at w naught. So, if you take a point w naught in the image then you get a whole disc centered at w naught in the image and that is exactly saying that every point in the image is an interior point of the image and that means that the image is open and that is the proof of the open mapping theorem. So, the te technical point is to show that this is an analytic function ok and everything follows from that ok and mind you the idea is very simple we are just using the counting principle the argument principle ok. So, I will expand upon this in my next lecture I will explain how to show n of w is an analytic function ok. So, I will stop here.